You want a war? You're gonna get one. Now get the gun! Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the 30th of November 1998. The series is now back in full swing as we continue to cover every match and every moment from the Monday Night War. Raw's in Baltimore, Maryland tonight while Nigel takes place in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We have lots to look at this week so make yourself comfortable and tell your loved ones you'll be zoned out for 40 minutes or so. This week we've got another jam up couple, Charles and Emma from Atlanta GA. Here they are on their honeymoon in Scotland. Charles grew up during the Attitude Era while reliving the war helped Emma to discover pro wrestling so that's awesome. Hope you guys had a great time at Loch Ness and I hope Nessie got a good look at those sweet t-shirts. Let's do it then, episode 162 of Reliving the War. WCW opened their show with a Nitro Girls dance while Tony Schiavone makes a big announcement. Hulk Hogan has retired from pro wrestling. Hogan said on The Tonight Show that he had to choose between wrestling or running for president and Wood from the Hood decided to hang up the boots in order to run the country. Tony also announces tonight's main event, Bret Hart vs DDP for the US title. A limo then pulls up the black and white NWO hopout and they are led to the arena and right to the ring by Scotty Steiner. Bischoff grabs a microphone and he says Big Papa Pump's the new leader of NWO Hollywood. Scott tells the fans to bow their heads and pay respect to Hollywood Hulk Hogan and Steiner confirms that Hogan made the decision to make the big bad booty daddy the new leader of the black and white. Scott says the NWO is a band of thieves, men who care about nothing and the NWO are going to continue taking care of business as they move forward. First on the agenda, Scott Hall. Tonight the black and white are going to make Scott pay and they are going to make Scott wish he was never part of the new world order. Steiner says Hall can find himself a tag team partner and the big bad booty daddy will team up with Horace to take on Scott tonight on Nitro. So Hall needs to find someone pretty quick because Big Papa Pump says NW Hollywood's going to bury the bad guy. So Hogan's gone ladies and gents, it's the end of an era. Just like that the Hulksters rode off into the sunset but that means we get more Scott Steiner promos and that isn't a bad thing. Conan then got a shot at Chris Jericho's TV title. Conan was all over the champion in the early portion of the match and he had an answer for everything Chris Jericho tried. A stun gun stopped Conan in his tracks though and the champ followed this up with a springboard dropkick and a plancha. k Dog then got punished on the outside and Jericho went in command back inside the ropes. A missed aerial attack though leads to Conan performing his rolling lariat and Chris nearly lost the championship following a fisherman suplex from the challenger. A lion salt wasn't enough to keep Conan down so Chris goes for a lion tamer and he thinks he's won the match but Conan got to the ropes. Jericho grabs his belt to celebrate, he then realizes that Conan's back on his feet. Jericho swings the belt but K-Dog hits the K-Factor face buster and we've got a new television champion on Nitro. Jericho's run has come to an end. Lex and Nash come out to celebrate the win as Chris tries to work out where it all went wrong. Slick Rick comes out for an interview and he directs his words at Eric Bischoff. According to Bischoff, Rick Flair's old but Rick says there's a difference in getting old and getting great. He then names a bunch of people who made Bischoff the man he is today. Ole Anderson, Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard, Wahoo McDaniel, Hollywood Hogan, Ricky Steamboat, The Road Warriors, Johnny Valentine, Sting, Lex Luger, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, Randy Savage. These are the men who made Bischoff who he is. Flair may be disappointed in Barry Windham but he's mad at Eric. He says Eric's an asshole and even if Bischoff fires Rick again, Easy e will always have kids and even Ted Turner himself saying an old man like Ric Flair called him out and Bischoff did nothing about it. Flair says he wants to wrestle Eric Bischoff so let's see if Eric responds. After a commercial break Scott Hall comes to the ring, he heard what Scott Steiner said earlier on and Hall says he doesn't have many friends so he'll be happy to face Horace and Steiner in a 2 on 1 match. 
Big Sexy then walks out. He gives Scott a little wave and Kev says the outsiders haven't seen eye to eye for quite some time. But if Scott needs a partner, Kevin Nash will be Scott's Huckleberry. Man, I am so, so happy. The outsiders are back and they're in action tonight on Nitro. Canyon and Raven were scheduled to take on the Armstrong brothers, but Raven's still being a little bitch and he refuses to compete in the match. Canyon tells Raven to get over it. He's sick of Raven blaming Mommy Raven for all his problems. Raven isn't the only one who had a rough time growing up, and it's at this point when Scott Armstrong attacks Canyon. Raven ends up leaving Chris all alone, and the Armstrongs make history by actually getting a win on Monday Nitro. Two tag team matches kick off Raw, Headbangers vs Oddities and the Outlaws vs The Brood. On Nitro, Bret Hart cuts a promo. Don't worry, the first Raw match doesn't actually happen. The ICP come to the ring with their new best friends, Mosh and Thrasher, and just as they were getting ready for the Oddities to come to the ring, they instead get greeted by Stone Cold Steve Austin. The Rattlesnake's got a shovel in his hand and it looks like he means business. Austin hits stunners on anyone stupid enough to stay in the ring before grabbing a microphone. He says buried alive 13 days away, but Stone Cold isn't going to wait that long. He promises that The Undertaker will be wearing that shovel upside his head by the end of the night, and that's the bottom line because Stone Cold said so. Straight to the point, no messing around. We're then told that a ladder match is going to take place later, Mankind vs The Big Boss Man for the hardcore title, and we've also got The Rock taking on the leader of the job squad, Al Snow. Mark Henry's getting ready for his big date with China tonight and we'll check in on the date in between matches and promos. Check this out too, look who Steve Austin bumps into backstage while searching for The Undertaker. It's NPC Stephanie McMahon. She has no idea where The Undertaker is, but if you remember this era well then you'll know that she's going to get well acquainted with the Prince of Darkness very very soon. Next up we have The Outlaws vs Edge and Gangrel. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Shut up. Gangrel was able to overcome the outlaws early on by spitting that red substance, as JR likes to call it, into Billy's face. Road Dog then took a few shots in the corner before getting hit with a Russian leg sweep, and then Edge came in with a flying head scissors and a top rope hurricane rana. Edge tries to do the same move on Billy Gunn, but he ends up getting power bombed, and then the corporation appears on the stage. The crowd boos when they realize Vince and company have just entered the arena, and Road Dog acknowledges the corporation when performing the dancey knee. Gangrel and Billy Gunn ends up in the ring and the match ends when Christian hits Mr. Ass with a tag team title belt. The corporation then run down to help the outlaws beat up the brood. So yes, the outlaws and the corporation have some sort of agreement in place and the fans aren't happy about it. Road Dog and Billy Gunn leave the arena while Shamrock and Boss Man continue their assault. Backstage, Austin continues his search for The Undertaker but he ends up getting locked inside a meat container by the dead man. Paul says The Undertaker has bigger fish to fry and he's got other business to take care of tonight and we're going to hear from the Prince of Darkness in just a moment. On Nitro, Bret Hart confirms that he is injured. He takes quite a few jabs at his opponent last week by referring to him as Little Dean Malenko. Bret says Dean tried to rupture his groin and the fans wouldn't know anything about that because no one in this building but the hitman even has a groin. Bret, <laughs> Bret says he has no choice, he can't fight Dallas tonight, so DDP comes out from the audience and after calling Bret, Bret the hit scum Hart, DDP says it's ironic that Hart had a hit list yet he's the one complaining about an injury. DDP wonders if Bret really wants the US belt and Bret says he's under doctor's orders, he can't wrestle, so Paige says Bret must have been been excellently executed, he was the best there was to take the diamond cutter and the best there ever will be to face the bang. Brett gets all fired up, he says he's been an underdog before, he's going to show everyone why he's the best but only under one condition, it has to be a no disqualification match. DDP doesn't even stop to think about it, he grants Brett the match, so the US title will be defended in the main event even though Brett's hurt. Mark Henry's buzzing for his date with China tonight and he wants Dilo to come along with him. Mark wants Dilo to come along to help with his confidence, but Dilo thinks he'll be hanging around like a spare dick. Still though, Mark's able to talk his tag team partner into going along with him, and Dilo's surprised to learn that Mark hired a limousine for his big night. 
Mark bought Dilo a new jacket. He got him some new shades. Dilo's feeling pretty good right now, but then Mark hands him a chauffeur hat. Dilo's not amused at all, but Mark again talks his friend into going along with this. And to get in a little practice, Mark makes Dilo close the limo door for him. The guys are off to pick up China, who I can't imagine is too eager to go on this date. Mark picks China up at her hotel, she tells Mark not to touch her, and Dilo continues to show his displeasure as the two lovebirds get in the limo. Next on Raw, The Undertaker cuts a promo, and on Nitro, Kidman defends the Cruiserweight title against Eddie Guerrero. Eddie shoves and slaps Kidman at the opening bell, and Kidman replies with a dropkick. A hard chop makes Kidman remember who he's in the ring with, but he comes back with a monkey flip, and we then see Kidman's slingshot head scissors. I think this is my favourite move in WCW right now. Eddie ends up on the outside and he dodges a plancha before sending Kidman into the ring steps. Eddie then drop kicks those steps into Kidman's leg and Guerrero keeps the pressure on with his slingshot sent on. During a commercial break, Eddie works over Kidman's arm and shoulder. The champ then takes a suplex before Eddie goes up for the frog splash but he wastes too much time and Kidman counters. Kidman fails to hit a top rope hurricane and Rana but he does manage to hit his signature face buster. We then see a tornado DDT from Billy, we then see the BK bomb, but Eddie's not going to stay down and Kidman ends up taking a head scissors before Eddie delivers a top rope tornado DDT. Again Guerrero goes for the frog splash but he's again too slow. Kidman delivers a superplex and when Billy tries to set Guerrero up on the turnbuckles again, the referee gets wiped out. Kidman goes up for the shooting star, Hoovy shows up, so Kidman kicks Guerrero off the apron and Rey Mysterio then makes an appearance. Mysterio hits Eddie with a dropkick and this sets Guerrero up for the shooting star press, Kidman wins via pinfall and he and Rey escape the ring before the LWO get their hands on them. Bam Bam Bigelow is sitting in the audience and he still wants Goldberg. Tony Schiavone reiterates that this man has not signed a WCW contract. On Raw, The Undertaker says he knows his little brother's in the building somewhere. He says his ministry grows stronger, as does The Undertaker's plague over the whole WWF, but Stone Cold Steve Austin currently stands in his way. Austin, however, is going to get kept on ice until rock bottom. So tonight, The Undertaker wants to take care of business and he wants to fight his little brother Kane. Kane marches to the ring, showing absolutely no fear, and Kane begins wailing on his big bro when he makes it to the squared circle. The Undertaker gets a chance to tombstone Kane though and the big red machine gets stunned for a moment. When Kane sets up, Paul Bearer and a bunch of guys dressed in white run to the ring, so it looks like the plan's to get Kane sectioned. The boys are armed with nightsticks and a straight jacket, Kane takes out as many as he can before getting out of the ring and escaping through the audience. So evidently Kane now has a pretty big problem. By the way I want to say hi to my one little fan out there, hello Smokey, my cat. X-Pac calls Shawn Michaels out to the ring next on Raw while Eric Bischoff has something to say on Nitro. Bischoff walks to the ring with Barry Windham and he says what we need right now is another hero. Crime rates are up, taxes are up, people can't put food on the table for their families. What the world needs is a hero and Bischoff is gonna give people that hero tonight. It's time to bring him out right now actually and that man is Dean Malenko. Dino Machino, what's going on here? Dean appears along with the horsemen and Stengel Malenko marches down to the ring all alone. Bischoff says it's time for Dean to be a hero, Dean's getting a big opportunity here to give Ric Flair a big opportunity. If Ric Flair wants to get in the ring with Eric Bischoff then Dean Malenko can make that happen, all he has to do is beat Barry Windham. Dean may have a bad leg but he says a horseman never backs down from a challenge, so Dean says yes he'll do it. Eric then says there's one little extra clause he forgot to mention earlier, this match is going to have a special referee, and that referee is the American dream Dusty Rhodes. Dusty gets in the ring, he shakes hands with Eric and Wyndham, and Dusty says tonight justice will be swift, he's going to call it right down the middle, and he won't let shenanigans get in the way of a clean match, he says all this while smiling at Barry Wyndham. So we'll see that match a little later on, but it's unlikely Dino Machino is going to overcome the 
these odds. On Raw, X-Pac says, if folks want to know what's up with the New Age Outlaws, then they should ask Billy and Road Dog. X-Pac wants to talk to the commissioner, Shawn Michaels, after what he did last week. HBK makes his way down to the ring, and Pac smiles when Shawn calls him kid. Sean reminds Waltman that HBK is the new sheriff in town, and if Sean wants any crop from Kid, then he'll pick it out of X Pac's teeth. Sean says he's had chunks of guys bigger than X Pac in his shit, and this makes X Pac wonder how wide Sean's bunghole is. Very good. Sean then says he's not an active wrestler, but if X Pac even looks at him the wrong way, then Sean will send him down to that money pit in Atlanta so fast it'll make Waltman's head spin. Seeing as X Pac wants to fight tonight, HBK books his old friend in a match against Ken Shamrock. Shamrock's IC title won't be on the line, but Waltman's European title will be. Sean then says hit my music and the DX song plays in the arena, and Sean tells X Pac to remember that HBK was DX before DX was cool. He's not wrong there. Mark Henry and China have arrived at the restaurant. China notices that Mark spent $1.99 on her flowers, but it's the thought that counts, China. Come on. I assume Dilo's gonna sit in the limousine and play his Game Boy while the two lovebirds have their dinner. That container that held Stone Cold Steve Austin has been opened. Austin's escaped, so someone must have opened the door. The hunt for The Undertaker is gonna continue on Monday Night Raw. Next up, we have Goldust vs Jeff Jarrett, while over on Nitro we've got two matches, Wrath vs Bobby Blaze and an open challenge from Ernest Miller. Owen Hart joins the commentary team, and he again says that he's retired, he's only here to see his friend Double J wrestle, and he's not the Blue Blazer. Jerry Lawler apologizes for assuming as much, but JR still thinks Owen's wearing the outfit so he can launch sneak attacks. Goldust vs Jeff Jarrett then, it was, it was pretty standard. Goldust had the match won after delivering the curtain call, but Deborah put Jeff's leg on the rope and the match continued on. Double J hits a swinging neckbreaker, Goldust replies with a bulldog, Jarrett then gets set up for the Shattered Dreams, but Deborah gets in the ring to stop the bizarre one, we have seen this before. Deborah shows off her assets, so Goldust shows off his, and then Owen jumps in the ring to attack Goldust. Just then, the blue blazer gets in the ring and the blazer attacks Owen. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute, that's the Blackman Torpedo. Could it be? You're as cold as ice. My god, a man of many disguises, a man of mystery. Stevie wants Owen to feel the power of the Murfug, but these referees managed to calm Blackman down. Owen got off lucky here tonight, folks, but again, let's see that Steve Blackman smile. That's a rare sight indeed. That's the face you make when you save the world from alien imposters. Backstage, The Undertaker's looking for Kane while Steve Austin looks for The Undertaker, the most watched game of hide and seek on cable television during 1998. On Nitro, Wrath annihilates Bobby Blaze in about 30 seconds, there's no story built around losing to Nash last week, there's no change in attitude or any inklings of self-doubt, it's just back to the same old Wrath and it kinda reinforces the fact that losing to Nash last week was unnecessary. The guy still hasn't cut a promo on Nitro either, like ever, so if things can't carry on like this, then Raph's just gonna remain in mid-card limbo. Ernest Miller says he wants to whoop somebody and tonight he'll take on any challenger, including some guy in the audience who only has two teeth. Perry Saturn answers the challenge and Miller says he's all about protecting the weak. Sonny Ono beat Perry before, so Ernest has no interest in fighting Perry. However, if Saturn can beat Ono tonight, then Perry will get his match at a future date. Sonny then freaks out, but clearly the cat has a plan. The match gets underway with Ono taking a falcon arrow, but Ernest then gets on the apron and Glacier shows up to hit Perry with a cryonic kick. Ono then covers Perry, but Saturn kicks out at two. Miller throws a chain into the ring and Sonny tries to use it, but Perry sees it coming and he takes the chain away. We then see the Death Valley driver, Perry gets a pinfall victory, but the decision gets reversed when the referee notices Saturn had a chain stuffed down his tights. Obviously, Perry didn't use it, but the referee doesn't know that, so Saturn won't be getting his match against Ernest Miller anytime soon, and Sonny Ono scores another victory over Perry. The Mankind vs Bossman hardcore ladder match takes place next on Raw. On Nitro, it's the Starcade 98 main event contract signing. HBK comes to the ring with the boss man, but Foley has some backup of his own as the job squad accompany him to the ring. These guys seem to have formed an alliance following what happened last week. 
HBK immediately sends the squad back to the locker room as boss man attacks Mankind with his nightstick. I can't recall ever seeing either of these two in a ladder match, but Mankind seems to have gotten the hang of it pretty early on as he throws the ladder into the boss man's face. The commissioner, who's joined the king and JR on commentary, isn't impressed with Foley's efforts and he gives him a minus two on his scorecard. Kimberly Page, he certainly is not. Foley bops boss man in the head with the ladder once again and the cameraman's so taken back by this that he falls on his ass. JR wonders why Michael sold out to Vince McMahon but HBK is adamant that he's still his own man and he'll make the best possible decisions for the WWF and its fans. Yeah, right. Mankind climbs the ladder to retrieve his hardcore title as boss man makes his way back to the ring. So Foley jumps from the ladder and he connects with a clothesline. Boss man then gets sandwiched in between the ladder and Mankind drops a few elbows as Sean on, begrudgingly gives Mick a 6 on his scorecard. Bossman finally gets some offense in, but Mankind immediately answers with a double arm DDT. Foley then gets his hands on the gold, but Bossman's able to recover and he slams him to the mat from the ladder before placing it in the corner. Mankind gets thrown face first into the steel before the Bossman sets up the ladder again to begin his climb. Foley's able to climb the ladder again himself though and the two exchange blows just below the hardcore title belt. Foley gets the better of it, allowing him to reach into his tights and grab Mr. Socko. Bossman takes the mandible claw at the top of the ladder and it looks like Mick's about to retain his title, but suddenly here comes the corporate champion to push the ladder over and send Mick crashing to the mat. Bossman looks destined to become the new hardcore champion but Mankind's able to fight back with a low blow to the rock before pulling Bossman down from the ladder. Foley begins to climb again but the rock knocks him off before delivering a rock bottom. This allows the Bossman to climb the ladder and he retrieves the title. We have a new hardcore champion crowned on Monday Night Raw and it's all thanks to the corporate champion The Rock. The corporation have finally taken everything away from Mick Foley, however he will have a chance at retribution at rock bottom when he challenges The Rock for the WWF Championship. That is, if he even makes it the rock bottom. The corporation lay into poor Mick after the match and this includes our supposedly unbiased commissioner. On Nitro, Goldberg and Nash take a seat in the middle of the ring and Nash is trying to get in the head of Goldberg clearly. He doesn't hesitate at all when putting his name on the document and Mean Gene says the contract also states that Goldberg won't defend the belt from now until Starcade, meaning the match is definitely gonna happen. Nash is acting like a goofball as Goldberg signs the contract, the Red Rooster makes sure that both guys spelt their names correctly and that's it, it's official. Nash vs Goldberg at Starcade 98. Bam Bam Bigelow then jumps the guardrail but he doesn't get his hands on Goldberg. He gets pulled out of the arena by Chattanooga's finest and Bam Bam ends up getting kicked out of the building. It's kinda weird that they're introducing Bam Bam right now as an opponent for Goldberg when Billy Boy's main focus should be on Big Kev and the Starcade main event, but I've learned at this point not to question these things, it just ruins any enjoyment you might get out of Nitro these days. Paul Bear tells The Undertaker that he found the big red machine. After a commercial break, we see The Undertaker attack his little brother and Kane gets smacked with a steel chair. Paul then wants to help Taker put Kane in a body bag, but the Phenom says it's fine, he's got this, and he doesn't need Paul's help. So Paul leaves the room while Stone Cold enters from another door. Austin knocks the dead man out with his trusty shovel, so now Austin has to work out what to do with an unconscious Undertaker. Next on Raw, it's Mark Merrow vs Baltimore's own Dwayne Gill while WCW presents Booker T vs Mike Enos. Mark says if he can't beat a jobber like Dwayne Gill then he's done, he won't be seen in the WWF ever again. And say goodbye to Marvelous Mark because he ends up losing this match. Merrow's another reliving the war original who says goodbye right here and it's all thanks to the blue meanie. Mero annihilated Gil and after a TKO Mark went up for the Marvelocity. The Meanie then showed up and he shoved Mark off the top rope and Dwayne Gil wins via pinfall. The Meanie appeared on Sunday Night Heat the night prior but he's here on Raw to help out the job squad so we lose Marvelous Mark Mero but we gain the blue guy. Mero does have another televised WWF match by the way, he wrestles on the UK exclusive pay per view Capital Carnage, but he's done now on WWF Raw and we have covered his whole WWF run from start to end. I'd recommend checking out his work as Johnny B Bad in WCW to be honest before his WWF stuff, I think he had better matches in world championship wrestling. 
Backstage, Paul Bears grab the white coats to take Kane away, completely unaware that The Undertaker has been wiped out by Austin. And over in the restaurant, Mark Henry's giving China one of his finest poems. China doesn't seem too amused. She necks her a glass of wine before pulling the bottle over, and Mark suggests that the two should get their groove on and go dancing. China says, what the heck? So we've got Mark Henry and China disco dancing coming up very soon. Can't wait. On Nitro, Booker T started his match off with a running forearm and Mike, I've never won a match on Nitro, Enos replied with a stun gun, followed by a clothesline to the outside. Mikey E then pulled off a chin lock and when the two get to their feet, Booker takes a corner clothesline. Booker replies with a spinning back kick, Enos then takes the axe kick, we see the spinner Rooney following a back suplex and Mike gets taken out with a jumping side kick. The match ends with a spine buster from Booker T and as much as I like Booker, I think I like Booker in competitive matches a bit more. The audience enjoyed it though and they raised the roof after the match. Give this guy a world title shot for crying out loud. Bam Bam Bigelow's still outside and he's losing his mind. It appears he's been forced to partake in a mid-card barbecue and he's not happy. Paul Bear brings the white coats into the room where the big fight took place and he checks the body bag. That's Kane in there alright. So the boys take Kane away to the mental institute and Paul waves goodbye to his son. Meanwhile Mark Henry's cutting a rug and what do you know, China seems to be having a good time. Mark decides to give it a break and go see the dealer out front and he leaves China all alone and of course a few goons try it on with the ninth wonder of the world. China smacks the most vocal guy with a forearm and Mark runs in to help China out and China has to pull Mark away before he wrecks the whole bar. A successful date for sure, it looks like the guys had a wonderful time. Next on Raw, it's Ken Shamrock vs X-Pac, while over on Nitro, it's Brian Adams vs Lex Luger. HBK once again accompanies a corporation member to ringside and Shamrock wastes no time going on the attack as Ken decks X-Pac right at the opening bell. Sean once again joins the commentary table and he's asked why he didn't make this match title for title. He explains that X-Pac got a shot at the WWF title last week and so now it's time to return the favour to someone else. Shamrock keeps the advantage with a back elbow in the corner followed by a modified slam. Pac's able to connect with a jumping clothesline and we then go backstage to see Vinny Mac and the Stooges talking to the Outlaws. Can't believe these guys have joined the corporation, they don't really fit do they? Back in the ring, Shamrock hits a big power slam followed by a version of the jackhammer for a two count before grounding Pac with a front face lock. The European champ fights out but he's stopped with a jumping leg lariat from Shamrock. X-Pac finds himself on the mat once again with a front chancery but he's able to fire up and escape before dropping the challenger with a kick to the face followed by a spinning heel kick for a two. Yet another kick to the face sends Kenny Boy into the corner and X-Pac scores with a bronco buster. HBK leaves the commentary table and he pulls referee Tim White out of the ring while Pac's able to connect with the X-Factor back inside. In the confusion, the big boss man comes down and he wipes Pac out with a clothesline. Shamrock's about to apply the ankle lock but here comes Triple H to make the save. This is the first time we have seen Hunter since he injured his knee at Summerslam and the fans in attendance went nuts for the return of DX's leader. It's one of those infectious crowd reactions that comes across really well on TV. Both Hunter and Pac mock the corporation on the ramp as HBK Bossman and Shamrock are left seething inside the ring. Triple H is now back so maybe now we'll get some more involved storylines surrounding Degeneration X. Everything Vincent does, he does it for Brian Adams, which includes accompanying him down to the ring to take on Sexy Lexi. As Lex makes his way out, Tony Schiavone mentions on commentary that Mark Curtis has been battling cancer for these past few months. This was the first time it was ever brought up on TV and Tony and Bobby say that everyone in WCW wishes him the best in his fight. A nice touch from the commentary team, a very genuine and heartfelt tribute. Luger takes the early advantage with a shoulder block and a back elbow. Big Brian counters with a back elbow of his own in the corner before hanging Lex's throat over the top rope. Back inside, Adams hits an atomic drop followed by a clothesline, no doubt making him feel like he's on cloud number 9. Get it? Nah. nah. Lex gets sent to the outside where Vincent can get in a few shots. Brian remains in control until Luger gets an elbow up in the corner and he goes on offense with right hands and a few clotheslines before signaling for the forearm. He manages to hit it but Adams bumps into the referee and I wonder did he say to the ref to please forgive him while Vincent slides a chair into the ring. Vincent then tries to attack Lex but to no avail, all while Brian grabs the chair and delivers a pretty weak looking shot across the back of Luger. 
This allows Adams to hit his dodgy pile driver on that same chair before reviving the referee to make the count. Lex, however, kicks out a two. Adams calls for Vincent to hold up the chair. He throws Lex towards it, but Lex counters and he sends Adams towards Vincent. Adams is able to stop himself, but Lex nails him from behind and Brian hits the chair anyway. Brian then staggers back and Luger's able to put the big man in the torture rack for the submission victory. I'm not sure which was more painful, the torture rack or all those forced Brian Adams puns. My apologies. Val Venus vs Tiger Ali's Sing on Raw, Dean Malenko vs Barry Windham on Nitro. If Dino can pull out a win here, Ric Flair gets his match against Eric Bischoff. Malenko still has that injured leg from last week on Nitro and if that wasn't bad enough, he has to contend with the NWO's Dusty Rhodes as the special referee. Despite all this, Dino's on top in the early going, forcing Windham to take a breather on the outside. Dean tries to launch another attack but Dusty stands in his way, allowing Barry to poke him in the eye and drop Dean with a gut wrench suplex. Barry continues the beating with a series of chops in the corner. Malenko's able to get some breathing room and he heads up top, but Wyndham clips the injured knee and Malenko goes right back down. Wyndham focuses his attack on the leg and even when Malenko gets to the ropes, Dusty won't call Wyndham off. Dusty also ignores a blatant low blow so it looks like Dean has no chance at all here. But then Dusty has a change of heart. Wyndham lays in the boots in the corner and suddenly Dusty calls for the bell. He backs Barry off and he raises the hand of Malenko. So it seems that the American dream is double cross Bischoff and the NWO. This came out of absolutely nowhere, but I suppose that's par for the course with WCW at this point. It's not all that surprising, but even the way the turn was pulled off throughout the match just seemed off or something. Eric comes out and he's a little miffed to say the least, so he fires Dusty Rhodes on the spot. Dream doesn't seem overly fussed to be fair, maybe he can see into the future. The horsemen come out to attack Wyndham with Flair being the first in line after Barry double crossed him last week. Flair then goes for Eric but Easy e gets ushered away by members of the black and white. Flair gets on the mic and he says this is the greatest Christmas present he's ever received. It's going to be the Nature Boy vs Eric Bischoff and there's nothing Eric can do about it. Over on Raw, the Godfather and his ladies of the night accompany Val Venus to the ring and Val wants the Godfather to keep Babu in check during this matchup. Godfather says he'd be happy to. During the match, Godfather sent his creatures over to Babu and the little guy got all hot and bothered. So that was Babu taken care of, no worries there. Moments later, Jackie and Terry showed up. Jackie distracted Godfather while Terry got in the ring to hit Val Venus right in the Val Boski. JR delivers a legendary call here when he says, Terry went back to familiar territory right here, going down on Val to deliver a low blow. Absolute brilliant stuff from JR. The referee watched it happen so Tiger gets disqualified and Val Venus goes back up the ramp with a swollen nutsack. The Acolytes then make their raw debut when they attack Tiger and Babu. These two also made an appearance on Sunday Night Heat by the way. But it was the Jackal who brought Farouk and Bradshaw together to form this team. It's a random pairing for sure and the Acolytes absolutely began because there was nothing else for Bradshaw and Farouk to do. But this random team would turn into one of the more memorable pairings of this era. Paul Bear sees the ambulance off that's carrying the big red machine and he says he's gonna go and find his undertaker. One small problem though Paul, Kane's still actually in the arena and he's standing beside Steve Austin. Paul just sent the phenom away in that ambulance so the rattlesnake and the devil's favourite demon are coming after Paul Bear. Shane McMahon then wanted to prove a point by making Sable come out to promote WWF's Attitude Cologne. Shane says Sable's doing what she does best right now. So Sable sprays Shane in the mouth when the boy wonder gets a little too close. Wonderful. Anyone out there still got a bottle of this stuff at home? I'm curious to know what Attitude in a Bottle smells like. I'd hazard a guess and say it smells like shit. Al Snow takes on The Rock next on Raw, on Nitro the Outsiders reunite to take on Horace and Scott Stanner. Slick Johnson's here and he comes out with Horace and Scott. Scott Hall comes out to no music, but what he does have is his former Outsiders partner Kevin Nash at his side. Nash gives Hall a little side glance as the two walk to the ring. Slick's gonna referee this one due to the ongoing referee strike when it comes to officiating Scott Steiner matches, so prepare yourselves for possible shenanigans, tomfoolery and hijinks. Hall shows his strength early on, bringing Horace down to a knee with shoulder blocks before taking him down with a fireman's carry. He then mocks Horace by paintbrushing him, but Scott then gets his receipt by eating a clothesline. 
His horse chokes Hall on the ropes. Shivani announces that he just received word that Eric Bischoff will face Ric Flair at Starcade. So that means Eric will perform on WCW's biggest show two years in a row. Hall's able to hit Horace with a choke slam before inviting Big Papa Pump to perform a lewd act upon him. But Mr. Steiner appears to politely decline this invitation. He does accept a tag though, and Steiner gets the upper hand with a number of heavy shots in the corner, followed by a clothesline. Slick Johnson makes a quick count when Steiner covers Hall, but the bad guy is able to kick out. The same happens again following Steiner's double underhook powerbomb, but again, Hall's able to escape. Hall gets placed on the top rope, but he's able to fight off Steiner's attempted suplex and he connects with a bulldog from the second rope. A low blow from Steiner allows Big Papa Pump to regain the advantage though and he throws Hall to the outside for Horace to get a few shots in. This doesn't last long as Big Sexy makes his presence felt and Horace gets whacked. And back inside, Hall continues to get worked over by Steiner and Hollywood Horace Hogan. Horace completely fails to read the audience as he applies a front face lock. We don't get excited for front face locks there lad, come on. Primarily because it allows Hall to easily make a tag to Big Sexy. Kev throws Slick Johnson out of the way and he cleans house, culminating with a big boot to the NWO's new leader. Nash throws Steiner to the outside as Horace gets on the middle rope to attack him, but Horace ends up going for a ride as Hall connects with the outsider's edge. Slick refuses to count, I mean he does have a point as Nash is technically the legal man, but Kev doesn't see it that way and the referee takes a jackknife. A second referee runs in and the outsiders win this tag team match via pinfall. Hall celebrates in the ring as Big Kev walks away to the back, showing that maybe there's a little tension still between these two even though Big Kev was Scott's huckleberry for the night. What's also interesting about this match is the fact that this is the first time the outsiders have tagged together in WCW as baby faces, and judging by the crowd reaction it was definitely a winning formula. The audience couldn't get enough of the outsiders. On Raw, Al Snow's proven himself to be one of the most popular acts in the company right now and in my opinion he's earned this main event match. The amount of foam heads and fan signs attest to the fact that Al Snow is indeed very much over with the audience. The WWF champion makes his way out to some truly dreadful theme music, thankfully it gets reverted back in record time, though this is the second time WWF have produced new music for The Rock that didn't fit. Al Snow gets some words of wisdom from Head, which actually proved to be effective as the leader of the job squad takes it to the corporate champion. Al connects with a clothesline and an inverted enziguri for a two count before trapping The Rock's arms and delivering a number of headbutts. Rock turns things around with a DDT, Al then gets thrown to the outside Side, but he's able to bounce Rock's head off the announce table. Al continues to dominate as he body slams Rocky on the floor, but he misses his follow up moonsault from the barricade, which allows Rock to finally seize control. Back in the ring, the Rock scores with a hot trick of clotheslines. Al tries to connect with one of his own, but he inadvertently nails the referee, and this allows the corporate champ to hit a rock bottom. He signals for the corporate elbow, but he decides to drag Al to the corner, and instead he places his head in the middle of the ring. Rock <laughs> Rocky removes the elbow pad, he hits the ropes, and Head gets hit with the elbow. Fantastic stuff from the WWF champ. He then looks to smack Al with his own head, out of context, that makes no sense, but Al ducks out of the way and Rock takes a hit. Al makes the cover, but the referee's down, so Rocky's corporate associates, Bossman and Shamrock, make their way down to the ring. Al gets distracted and Rock's able to hit rock bottom number two, and Earl Hebner wakes up long enough to count the pinfall. The corporate champion steals a win in the Raw main event. Funnily enough, his old theme music plays after the bell rings. Whether or not this was a production error, I don't know. Mankind comes down to get some of the boss man and Shamrock, but once again, the numbers are too much for him to overcome. Rock even gets in a few shots with the boss man's nightstick before the rest of the job squad come down to attempt to even the odds. The Rock, meanwhile, grabs his WWF belt and he heads back up the ramp as the brawl continues at ringside. He doesn't make it very far though as Mankind attacks him from behind and the two fight on the stage and into the back. Raw ends with Kane and Steve Austin getting their hands on Paul Bear. On Nitro, we've got Bret Hart vs DDP for the US title in a no DQ match. Before the Nitro main event, Goldberg dashes out of the building to fight Bam Bam Bigelow. The two finally throw down and it's an all out brawl. It's actually quite fun with the fans going crazy in the background as the two beat each other up beside parked vehicles, but eventually security step in and Bam Bam again gets pulled away. Goldberg's able to break through security and he pulls off a spear just before Nitro takes a commercial break. 
So, Brett's legitimately injured, but the commentators are trying to play it off like Brett's once again playing possum. You can tell Brett's in a bad way as he hops back to the corner during a lockup, but he does manage to hit a low blow on Paige. Dallas then gets choked out in the corner, the US champ takes a few rights, but the master of the diamond cutter turns it around and it's Brett who ends up taking a beating in the corner. Paige then goes to put on a figure 4 on Brett around the ring post, so the giant shows up and the big man breaks up the hold. Basically, the giant's gonna do all the work here and and it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Why even book this match in the first place? DDP takes a choke slam in the middle of the ring. Brett then decides against the sharpshooter, and instead he wakes Paige up for another choke slam. This time it's a super choke slam from the big man, and you gotta admit that looked great. Brett then locks in the sharpshooter. DDP's been knocked out, so His Excellency wins the match, and Brett's the new US champion. Only WCW would give an injured wrestler a championship belt. Still, it's a title win for Brett, Smokey the Cat was happy, so we should all be happy. On Raw, Steve Austin bumps into Paul Bear and Kane emerges from that container. The rattlesnake and the big red machine bring Paul to the ring and it looks like Paul's already in a bad way. Austin wants to know how Paul feels, knowing The Undertaker can't save him tonight before going over the events of last week. Stone Cold reminds everybody that Paul and Taker were going to bury him alive last week and when that wasn't good enough, they were going to embalm Steve alive. Austin calls Paul a sick bastard before requesting a beer, and he then asks fans if they want to see Kane destroy Paul Bear. The crowd say hell yeah, but Austin wants to do more than whip Paul's ass. Austin pulls out a pair of scissors, remember Paul cut up Austin's clothes last week in the funeral home? Bear pretends to pass out but Stone Cold isn't buying it, so Dr. Austin goes to work and he starts cutting up Paul's shirt and tie. Austin says he's gonna gut Paul with those scissors, but then he has an even better idea. Idea. Austin, Kane and Paul are gonna go for a little walk. The three head out to the back and all the way to the main streets of Baltimore. Kane then opens a manhole and Paul gets sent in head first. That's how Raw ends this week and what a great ending to the WWF's flagship weekly show. Raw wins it again this week. The ending was good, the China and Mark Henry stuff was pretty funny, there were a lot of indecisive finishes, but still Raw was a very entertaining show. It's the same story as always, you'll find the match of the week on Nitro thanks to the cruiserweights, but the cruiserweights can't carry a whole 3 hour program. Raw's just jam packed with ridiculous fun and it makes for a better television show. Raw's on 79 points, Nitro's on 65 and we've got 18 ties on the board. In the television ratings, Raw won with a 5.0, Nitro posted a 4.2. Next week on Raw, Triple H wants answers from the New Age Outlaws. The Acolytes take on Val Venus and The Godfather, and The Rock teams up with The Undertaker for a tag team main event match. On Nitro, Glacier takes on Perry Saturn, way hey. Scott Hall faces Scott Steiner in a one on one match, and Bam Bam Bigelow competes in the Nitro main event. I hope to see you all next week, thank you so much for watching as always, and please take care. Get ready for some Saturday Night Fever with Ross Wunderkind and some disco dancing with the Disco Inferno. Be so funny. Be so funny.